Good morning. Welcome to Mission Control Houston and the International Space Station Flight Control Room. This is the home of the space station's lead flight control team, coordinating the work in control centers all around the world to keep the station flying in good shape while assisting the Expedition 56 crew members with their science and maintenance work on orbit. Also on the agenda this week was seeing to the safe departure of a commercial cargo ship, which has already executed a satellite deployment on its way to completing a garbage disposal when it makes its fiery demise. Houston Station on Space to Ground. Welcome to Space to Ground, I'm Gary Jordan. This week, a vehicle filled with tons of trash and a few satellites said farewell after 52 days aboard the station. The Northrop Grumman Cygnus was released early Sunday morning filled with over 6,600 pounds of trash. After traveling safely away from the station, Northrop Grumman flight controllers took over to fly the Cygnus a number of miles away to deploy a series of six satellites with the Nanorax CubeSat deployer. Cygnus is stationed to remain in orbit until July 30th, when it will fire its engines for the last time to begin its fiery demise in the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. For the crew, it was right back to work. Nothing is more concrete in an astronaut's schedule than science. The crew mixed the contents for the microgravity investigation of cement solidification, or MIX. MIX aims to use the unique environment of the space station to understand this complex process, including how to describe hydration reaction and microstructure formation in cement pastes that could be applied for use in space and on Earth. This week's question comes from T. Pose, who wanted to know how to keep food fresh in space. There are a few methods they use on the International Space Station, and they keep food fresh for quite some time. Space Station food usually comes in two ways. One is thermostabilized, which comes in those grayish green packages that you may recognize from the military. These can be eaten right out of the package or warmed up for a nice hot meal. The other is freeze-dried, where the water is sucked out before launch and needs to be added back into the packaging before consumption. These methods keep the food shelf-stable for a few years and can reduce the weight so you can launch a lot of meals at once. Keep sending in your questions using the hashtag space to ground. And if you're a middle school teacher, be sure to tell your students to request images of specific locations on Earth as part of NASA's EarthCam program. See you next week. Off the Earth, for the Earth. Space to ground. The EarthCam experiment Gary mentioned is just one part of the International Space Station's effort to share human spaceflight with students on the ground. The year of education on station is another. During this year, when we have a former classroom teacher in space, the crew members use some of their time to shoot videos explaining scientific principles and important topics related to human space exploration. A couple of months back, astronaut Scott Tingle released this demonstration video about the importance of nutrition for men and women who are of this planet, if not on it at the moment. Hello, and welcome to the International Space Station. My name is Scott Tingle. Here on the space station, we live in a microgravity environment, which makes eating here a very unique experience. To stay healthy, we have to maintain a nutritious diet, just like we would back on Earth. Let's go take a look at some of our food and drinks and check out our meal preparation area. 
During long duration spaceflight, we have to make sure that we receive enough energy, proteins, and vitamins. Our food lab back on Earth makes sure we get plenty of each as they carefully prepare, test, and package everything. We combine all of this excellent nutrition with exercise to ensure our bodies stay healthy and strong while we're here. We eat three square meals a day, just like we do on Earth, maybe throw in a snack or two. One of my most favorite foods to eat are natural raisins. Here on Space Station, we have to keep our calories up if we want to get all our work done. And the carbohydrates in these raisins really help. And they're kind of fun to eat, too. And how do we stay hydrated in microgravity? With these special pouches. They're filled with water, and we use a straw that has a one-way valve that prevents water from floating out of the pouch while we're not drinking from it. Here's a liquid drink. This is a tropical punch for today. I love drinking fluids on station. Here on station, we have a pretty cool food preparation area. We have a place to get fresh water to, for us to drink or to put in our rehydratable foods. And we also have an oven to put food in. We pick out some of our favorite foods, chicken fajita for me, put it in the oven, close the door, and turn it on. In about 15 minutes, I'm gonna have a warm meal. Thanks for exploring a little nutrition with me. I'm gonna send you back to Earth so you can create your very own astronaut menus. See you again soon. you watch some of our features, you get a chance to see views of planet Earth that are captured from 250 miles above as the International Space Station cruises along at a speed of some five miles a second. Well, along with those cameras on the outside of the vehicle, the station has some great picture windows that the human crew can use. And in the Destiny Laboratory, they have a special piece of hardware that combines art and science. an intersection of art and science on the station. Presented by Science at NASA. Large and powerful telescopes have delivered stunning images of our galaxy and the universe. A little closer to home, my colleagues have taken some equally stunning photographs of our own planet from the International Space Station. My name is Mario Runco, and I'm an Earth scientist and former space shuttle astronaut. After seeing our beautiful home planet from orbit, I wanted to be able to share the experience with everyone. So one of the NASA accomplishments of which I am most proud was helping to spearhead the creation of the WARF, the Window Observational Research Facility on the ISS. My colleagues, Dr. Dean Epler and Dr. Karen Scott and I, envisioned a small facility, about the size of a large refrigerator, that would enhance the capabilities of the large Earth-viewing optical quality window that we were previously successful in getting aboard the station. This vision became reality as the wharf was launched to the station in 2010 on board the STS-131 mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery. The optical quality window and the wharf are a perfect blend of art and science. They allow us to conduct Earth science research and capture amazing high-resolution photographs of the Earth. The window is located in the U.S. Destiny Laboratory module and features the highest quality optics ever flown on a crewed spacecraft. It is 20 inches or 51 centimeters in diameter and includes a non-optical quality retractable pane that protects it when it is not in use, but still allows natural light into the station and provides a great view for the crew. The wharf is capable of housing a variety of sensors within the shirt sleeve environment inside the space station and serve as a test bed for the development of new sensor technology. These sensors can be used to study atmospheric, oceanic, and surface terrain conditions, as well as make environmental health assessments. Observations made from the wharf can provide important data on transient atmospheric and geologic phenomena, such as tropical cyclones and volcanic eruptions. 
It also helps us to better understand our local solar system environment. The National Laboratory Meteor Investigation allows for spectroscopic analysis of meteors as they enter the Earth's upper atmosphere. The WARF's presence on the space station allows its sensors to image the same location or region multiple times over several days. This allows for observations that can show, for example, how vegetation below may be changing from day to day. Subtle changes detectable by orbital sensors that might be indicative of declining plant health are rarely visible on the ground in their early stages, and often by the time they are, it is too late and crops or even forests may be lost. My colleagues and I are all avid Star Trek fans, and we decided to name the facility Wharf after the Honorable Klingon Warrior. We designed a mission patch that included Klingon script for the acronym Wharf, and even an alternate version with a depiction of an astronaut bearing an uncanny resemblance to science officer Spock making observations of the Earth from the Wharf. For more of the many wonders that can be observed from Earth orbit, go to nasa.gov forward slash ISS dash science. For similar out of this world stories, visit science.nasa.gov. The International Space Station is home to science that's aimed at learning more about planet Earth as well as the people who inhabit it, and then has goals in other scientific uh, in investigations too. For example, the plant gravity perception experiment is germinating seeds in microgravity to test the plant's ability to detect gravity and then adapt to grow successfully in that environment, which is going to be necessary on future missions out into deep space in which crew members will have to grow some of their own food. Think about the fact that the shape of every plant you've ever seen is the result of gravity sensing. Every plant has gravity sensing cells and those cells contain dense bodies they're packed with starch and when that organ is displaced away from its starting position those dense starch filled packets they fall to the lower wall of the cell what we don't know is much about what happens after that and so our question our experiment is aimed at what's the least amount of gravity that a plant can detect and cause that kind of sedimentation and the way we're getting at that is to add fractional gravity to plants as they grow and ask the plant, how about that? Can you feel that much? How about, here's a little bit more. We'll turn it up just a little more. Can you feel that? We're growing 120 of these at all different gravity levels on the station. So we have planned a whole series of experiments at fractional gravity levels while we're visualizing the plants as they grow. So we have a, a cell culture chamber that has two rotors, uh, centrifuge rotors, and these sort of stack, they align along the radius of the rotor um, at different distances. And the, the amount of gravity experienced by the plant varies depending on how far it is along that rotor arm. Our lowest treatment, I think, is down to about uh, six one thousandths of a G, all the way up to one G to get a good control for, for Earth response. Plant shape is, is critical uh, in breeding programs to determine optimal growth uh, for crop productivity in roots and in shoots. So lots of uh, potential applications, uh, both off the earth and on the earth. Research on technology is another aspect of the International Space Station's science mission. A recent delivery was an experiment called optical fiber production in microgravity provided by the private company Made in Space. It operated on the station for a few weeks and then was returned to Earth on the same Dragon cargo ship that brought it to orbit. Its goal was to demonstrate both the scientific and the commercial merits of manufacturing exotic optical fibers in space. We're excited at Made in Space to work with NASA and CASIS to use the ISS National Lab. Made in Space Fiber Optics is a payload to manufacture Z-Bland glass fiber in microgravity. It will produce hundreds of meters of very, very high-end optical fiber. Manufacturing fiber in microgravity uh, has been theorized to um, in increase the performance by creating a, a better product. And by better product, I mean a a, a clear, more pure, 
glass. And that is due to the, the microcrystal formation. It makes the glass a little cloudier when, when the crystals form here on Earth. And in space, it'll be more pure and clear. And in microgravity, they form in, in a different way, in a, in a more pure way with, with fewer defects. What could happen is a hundred time increase in performance. This is a really cool project because it can benefit everyone here on Earth. You know, fiber optics are used for various applications, medical devices, lasers, but also internet. And, uh, and this can really help you know, improve bandwidth and performance um, and, and lower the cost of internet and, and data centers. So really, it, it's a product that can affect everyone. Astronaut Drew Feustel is the commander of the International Space Station's Expedition 56. He's made three spacewalks on this flight already. Before that, he made three spacewalks during a space shuttle assembly mission to the station. And before that, he made three EVAs on the last servicing trip to the Hubble Space Telescope. His aptitude at working with his hands was apparent long before he got to NASA, before he earned a PhD in geological sciences, back to his days as a car mechanic. How would you like to be the guy on the last servicing mission of Hubble to do the first thing on the mission, which is the most important thing, and then break the bolt? Um, well, I grew up in Detroit. Detroit's the Motor City. Uh, my father and uncle were both engineers for Ford Motor Company. Um, I was always exposed to, you know, mechanics and mechanical things. And, and then while I was attending uh, community college, um, I landed a job, a uh, classic automobile restoration shop, and particularly work on old 1950s Jaguars. And that was where I, I guess you could say, worked professionally as an automobile uh, mechanic and restoration specialist. And being a mechanic has been very beneficial to me, I think, as an astronaut. My first mission was repair of the Hubble Space Telescope, and I think that uh, my skills and my aptitude with tools had a lot to do with the assignment to that mission. Because the first EVA that we did was to replace the Wide Field 2 camera. Well, my first flight to space, my first EVA ever, my first task in space was to go out with a wrench and release the bolt on Wide Field Camera 2. And I was doing my job, got in my suit that day, went outside, got on the arm, got my tool out, went up to the telescope, and tried to release the bolt, and the bolt was stuck. So eventually they said, okay, take the torque limiters off and just, you know, release the bolt. There's really no way to control whether you're gonna break it or not. And so that's what we did. We just, I just put as much force into it as I could. Okay, here we go. I think I got it. It turned, it definitely turned. Yep, it turned. Then luckily, it, it, it came loose instead of, you know, breaking in the telescope. It actually came loose and we were able to retrieve it. I'm proud to be a mechanic. I'm proud to work with my hands. That skill set has been very valuable to me, and, and we know that uh, from astronauts who have been to the space station before us that you know, much of the work that we do in space is about keeping the systems operating, keeping the experiments operating, working outside with external repairs on EVA, spacewalks, and all of those things that we do involve tools and working with tools and making repairs to equipments. I've just really been lucky in my career that I had that skill set that I brought with me uh, into the office. I'm Drew Foistel, and I'm an astronaut. Follow your dreams. The International Space Station is a platform for science about the Earth, but it also hosts science and technology research that is benefiting life on the Earth, while supporting plans for future exploration far, far away from Earth. For example, the future deep space missions that carry human explorers will have to support those people with clean water. Station research in that area has had achievements that are already paying off on orbit, but also led to an inexpensive, easy-to-use tool that allows people on the planet to check the purity of their water. Most of the children, they come here 
with waterborne disease. So many children under five suffer for diarrhea. They're complaining about the abdominal pain, ear skin lashes. They get waterborne illness through drinking water. Most of the community members had little knowledge regarding the use of safe water and what safe water is. Because most of the water we use it without knowing it is affected with disease or not. So we need to test them so that we make sure that the water is safe or not safe. A lot of people have the idea that water quality is too hard to do in the field and it's too complicated. Having to transport samples, having to have reliable electricity, having to heat samples or keep samples at certain temperatures or put them in refrigerators. But um, probably the biggest challenge uh, is, is actually the, the, the cost. The price was really high, up to $300 a test. Uh, so all those things come together to make it really difficult to use a traditional laboratory approach uh, when you're testing water. What's been missing is the really simple, cheap test kit, and that solution came from above. On the space station, we recycle almost all the water that the astronauts drink, and that constitutes a risk because um, if that water became contaminated, the astronauts would have to abandon the space station in, in the worst case scenario. What we needed on the space station was something that was small, uh, easy to transport, and didn't require a lot of training for the astronauts. We developed a water test kit that was really easy to use um, and used off-the-shelf components, and we called that the Microbial Water Analysis Kit, or MWAC. It's basically a bag that changes color in it, and the astronauts just had to hook it up to the water system, take the sample, store it overnight, and read it the next day. It worked great, and then it's still in use today. This was when we realized we had a chance to make a difference in the world using the same technology that was used by NASA, but applied in a remote area of a developing country. We started in water for the biggest health crisis on the planet, which is a lack of safe water. The test kit is revolutionary because of its cost. It lowers the cost of testing water points from hundreds of dollars to about five to seven dollars. It can be done on site in the remote region, and it can give you a result within 24 hours. I take a sample today, tomorrow I have results. To use a M1 kit is very easier. But we learned that testing water by itself wasn't enough. With a mobile app, people could map water sources and record the data. So that way we're building sort of a global database of water information that, that everybody can contribute to and share with others. So what that meant was people who before didn't have a feasible and affordable way to test water suddenly had a, a, the means to know which water sources around them were safe. It's made people much more aware of the issues of water quality. That's a very powerful thing. And that's all due to technology that we've borrowed from the International Space Station. So now we're able to assemble a really low cost water quality test kit to ship all over the world. We've been working with the local health ministry and the water utility in Mwanza, Tanzania since 2013. Through that technology, most of the citizens in Mwanza have an increased awareness regarding the kind of water they use and whether it causes them any waterborne illnesses or not. People are now treating their water and avoiding sources of water which could be contaminated. I've seen a growing awareness. It is very unusual for technology that is used in international space stations to be used in developing countries like Tanzania, but it, it, it can be used and it should be used because this technology is not limited to only developed countries, but for all humankind. A good portion of the research being done on the International Space Station is intended to support future missions out beyond Earth, to the Moon and Mars and out into the solar system. The people responsible for developing those projects are heroes, just as much as the astronauts who will get to go to space. So you want to go to Mars. What does it take to be a NASA hero? Meet the heroes behind the scenes who make deep space exploration possible. People often think of astronauts as heroes, and they are. 
and they will be the first ones to tell you that there are many other people who make space missions successful. On Earth, there's ground support, the folks responsible for launch and landing. Heroes work in mission control and keep a watchful eye on the astronauts and spacecraft 24-7. Heroes design, test, build, and fly the rockets and spacecraft that take astronauts off our planet. And there are heroes who make spacesuits, habitats, and equipment for the astronauts to live and work on the moon and Mars. Human spaceflight is possible because of the heroes on the ground and behind the scenes who build the technology and systems needed to send astronauts into the solar system. Will you be a NASA hero? For more information, visit this NASA website. NASA's Johnson Space Center is the center of activity leading the design and buildup for a critical safety test for America's new exploration spacecraft. An Orion crew module was delivered to Houston in March for assembly and outfitting for the April 2019 Ascent Abort 2 test, which will demonstrate the ability of this spacecraft's launch abort system to pull the crew module to safety if an emergency ever arises during ascent. Doing this work at JSC is part of a lean approach to development to minimize cost and schedule risks associated with the test. If you'd like to get <coughs> if you'd like to get another look at any of the stories we featured today, check us out on YouTube and on Facebook at the addresses that magically appear on the screen. Uh, and while you're there, check out all the other great stuff you can also find about NASA and America's human spaceflight program. And if you're interested in good conversation about space exploration, check out Houston. We have a podcast featuring folks here at NASA talking about their work and their personal experiences on the job. New episodes post on Fridays. Well, today, July 20th, my colleague Gary Jordan talks with Tabby Kalisa from NASA headquarters about some of the cool ways NASA helps small businesses get involved in space exploration and scientific discovery. Go to www.nasa.gov slash Johnson slash HWHAP. Houston, we have a podcast. You'll find all the episodes there. You can also listen on iTunes and Google Play and SoundCloud. This is Mission Control Houston. Thank you.